Okay. Well, just at the beginning. Yes. Is that okay? Yes. Um, well, we come to the last session. Um, the situation is that Mark is yes. going to take the floor. Thank you very much, Mark. Pleasure. Great. Thanks. To, nice to be here. It's a really exciting um, uh, meeting, and I'm really happy to have been here all day and heard these wonderful talks and been inspired, I'm sure, like your, yourselves and across the world. Um, so this, for this last 35 minutes of the session um, of the meeting, um, we're going to have a sort of open discussion, trying to bring together some of the major threads and look ahead, perhaps. And um, my name is Mark Ludovnik. I'm a material scientist. And um, I've been working in and been interested in self-healing materials for a long time, which clearly bio-inspired technology. And, and the reason I'm doing that is because I really think the future of infrastructure is going to be self-healing. I think our bridges, our buildings, our cities, even perhaps our phones, are going to heal themselves, are going to have to heal themselves, <laughs> uh, in the next century or so. Um, and um, I'm really wondering what everyone else thinks about these kind of topics and what our speakers think about these. And I kind of just want to kick off by saying a few things, one of which is that this is bio, so we heard wonderfully about all these different bio systems today from our speakers, starfish cells, uh, geckos, beetles, plants, bacteria, and I think, like you, we, you know, we all marvelled at them. So that there's, there's the bio we had today, and we had the inspiration, the sheer beauty in some senses, right, which is nothing to be ashamed of. I mean, it's part of, I think, I'm probably sure that a lot of us are doing this because that we're attracted by the sheer beauty of nature. Um, but it has to be more than that, and I suppose the other inspiration which we've heard about today is things like a creative spark, a, 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 an idea that's just, that's it, it's just the idea and off you go in a different direction, it doesn't have to be a replica of the biological system. And, and, and we saw Ray just throwing out, you know, here's, here's a biological system, I'm fascinated by it, someone, so hopefully someone will get inspired by that, and I think that is the purpose of these meetings, and I think that's the purpose of science in general. So all those things are great. And, and also, I think there's a cultural significance, as, uh, as Neil alluded to earlier, that you know, things like photosynthesis, all of these things, we, we are biological organisms ourselves, we live on a planet. I think it's important, it, just as it's important to study history and literature and music, it's important to study the natural world, just for its own sake, because we are it. <laughs> um, but then, the title of this meeting is New Technologies, by inspired New Technologies. So we, we have a duty to look ahead, look, look at what's going to be inspired by them. And I really would like to provoke my fellow panellists to have a go at that, however kind of speculative you think it is, because that's, it's, this, is, this is the time. You're experts in your field. We've got a global audience. It'd be great to hear your thoughts about that. But I'll just throw out a few things, one of which is, you know, we have some big problems. <laughs> we have a big problem about global warming. Um, I feel like, you know, if we're going to have a, 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 um, a society dedicated to science and bio-inspiration, we, we really need to be thinking about how that's going to be, uh, do something about that. Um, we also have a problem of waste. And this may, be not, it may not matter to some people, because essentially we've got lots of big holes in the ground which we currently put all of our waste, and there is plenty more holes in the ground that we could put it into, and it's probably not an immediate problem. But I just feel like it really, it, it, it's terrible for the scientific and engineering community that we've created all these wonderful technologies and then they end up floating in the Pacific Ocean. And the people who see that and, and, and the organisms that get affected by that, you know, it just, it just tells you that we haven't really thought it through, that we're not as good as we think we are. And, and I feel like that is a terrible advert for our community and we really, really need to do something about it. Um, so it may not be an economic imperative, and it may be, not be a social imperative, but I think it's a cultural imperative to, get, to do something about plastic waste in the oceans. Anyway, there's a couple of, uh, there's a couple of ideas. I wonder if I can hand over... Um, what we're going to do is give each one of our panellists five minutes mm. to have a kind of bit of a, <laughs> a rant, perhaps, or a discuss, and then, and then we'll bring it together and, and we'll open up to the audience for further questions. Um, so we've got Patricia Basaru from CNRS. We've got Mark... Koski from Stanmore, and we've, we've got George Whitesides from Harvard. You've heard them all before, but here's five more minutes. Um, shall I hand over to you, Mark, first? Sure. And I have, actually, there's one or two slides on the laptop there, um, just to illustrate the, the points I want to talk about. So I want to go back to the opening um, 
comment that, that sort of kicked off uh, today's events, which is that um, biological structures and processes have been refined over millions of years, and so why should we not um, take advantage of what nature has discovered in um, our own technology? Well, yes, exactly. And in fact, the more we learn, the more inspired we become. And I'm, I must say, already very much inspired by uh, many of the talks I've heard today. I have all kinds of ideas. But I'm also very daunted because everything is just extremely complex. And um, uh, in particular, I look at some of the, the processes and structures that were talked about by Euro Deng, by Patricia uh, Bassereau, and by others. They're, they're um, actually much more complicated than the adhesive structure of the gecko. And that's already too complicated uh, for me to fabricate correctly. So I have to make um, crude approximations. Uh, so I'm also very much um, in the market for new, new techniques, new technologies. And the, the slide up here behind me is um, we learned that, that um, some people that we've collaborated with had uh, received one of the new uh, two-photon stereolithography machines, uh, Nanoscribe. And we became very excited because the, the resolution of that machine, at least in theory, is down to around 350 nanometers. And um, so we, we made up a, a CAD model of what we thought, look, you know, if we could only make it, this is what we really would like to make. We kind of know what shape we want to. It, it would look like this. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, um, you'll see what happened. Wait, can you do it? It actually yeah. clicks through a couple of times. I'll just go up. Oh, yeah. See. Um, so, um, well, let's see. What do I want? Page down? No. This down is a image. Aha. All right, well, there was our first approach. We took our CAD file, we had the software decompose it into slices, and, and there was result. Well, remember, this is what we were trying to make. Uh, this is what we got. And we realized that, well, there were all kinds of problems. You basically, when you're trying to push the limits of the machine, you can't just let it decompose your computer-aided design files. You have to take it in hand and drive the laser yourself. And it started to get a bit better but it was taking an entire day just to make this little array and they still don't look quite right. And then we realized that, you know what? We really only need the laser. We don't, we don't need to solidify the whole structure. We only need to solidify the outer shell, uh, sort of the exoskeleton of this structure to solidify it. And then we can um, put the whole thing in batch irradiate it under UV light. And it started to get a little better. And indeed, the geometry is looking actually quite promising now. Um, but there's still a problem, which is to, to make a little uh, batch of uh, 10 by 10 of these, not even, I think, it's, it's uh, maybe 8 by 8 of these things is, is taking hours, more or less an entire day. And of course, I don't need a fraction of a square millimeter. I need hundreds of thousands. I want square centimeters. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing. That's the question. I, I want to leave um, with, with the question to everybody, which is that um, we need processes that, I mean, you know, if you think about what's going on in nature, we have things growing and differentiating by cell by cell in parallel and, and making these wonderfully complex and sophisticated structures. And if you think about what's going on with the gecko, I mean, that's just beta, it, it's the, the adhesive structure is not living tissue, it's just beta keratin, like a fingernail or, or like hair. So what's happening is it cells on the gecko's toes are um, uh, excreting or secreting this material and it's starting to clump together and clump together until you form acetylstroc and it's doing this every month because they molt um, and um, that's what I want. I want a process where I can start to program uh, some of these uh, wonderful geometries that I'm, that I'm hearing about with um, a range of length scales, let's say from uh, 10 nanometers up to 10 centimeters uh, without incurring enormous cost and having to go to a completely new um, set of machinery uh, each time I, I try to add another level of complexity. Thank you. Uh, okay. <laughs> I feel like it needed that. Um, Patricia. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to do anything, propose anything to clean the ocean, but ah. uh, unfortunately. Um, I would say that uh, after this day, I realized that um, we didn't get much about synthetic biology. 
uh, I mean, mm. the way it's normally, or at least classically, uh, understood. And uh, I think that, uh, for many cases so far, synthetic biology uh, is basically a, a, a smart way to do nice chemistry. So to produce, uh, for instance, drug by using bacteria would do your job for you and make kind of, a, a, let's say, a precursor for, 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 for drugs, for instance, or producing oil or stuff like that. So I think we, we didn't hear much about that, but I think it's the way that synthetic biology is, is done so far. But, um, but uh, I think Nail was uh, somehow showing that at least some, some, some can be done by playing with a, with a with, um, with the retina pro um, molecules. But uh, I would say that um, uh, co going back to what I, I was talking this morning about, um, I was trying to explain you that it's possible to build up systems and uh, the, the system based on membrane and, and uh, machineries which can produce something. So I think that is something which is also one of the possibility for, for, uh, sen for synthetic biology in the future. So I don't know, uh, I don't know what will be done in, uh, eventually, but I think that uh, in many cases, I mean, for instance, uh, I have a, I think a, an interesting uh, example. Some time ago, people were building up ori DNA origami for for instance. And when I, I saw these people being up DNA origami, I was wondering, what can we do with that? And it was maybe 10 years ago. And I thought it was kind of, a, let's say, an interesting game, but I didn't see the purpose. And I think that right now we see many more application of DNA origami, and it was difficult to predict before. So my, my, my point would be that now, even though the, 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 the the system based on membrane and machinery encapsulated in, in, in vesicles is still very basic. I think it's difficult to predict right now which will be done in 10 years. I mean, we don't know what we can, we can do with that. And I think that just uh, by uh, trying to, to, by copying and uh, being inspired by, 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 by cells, for instance, maybe we can just build something that we have no idea about before, I think. And, um, um, so um, based on that, I mean, also, uh, I wanted also to maybe to share some ideas about, uh, with you about uh, what, some questions which I think are interesting and also can maybe bring to a uh, new, maybe new system. And uh, I think uh, maybe I can use my slide? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <coughs> yes, exactly. This is here. So, um, I think that uh, what I was showing you to you this morning that at least you, ha you need to have uh, in cell, in many cases you, have, uh, you need cooperativity between proteins uh, to uh, produce some, some, some action. So by, for instance, I was talking about producing a vesicle, so you need a sequential action of proteins to produce a vesicle. Same for motility, so you need a sequential action of different proteins, and they have to work cooperatively for that. And I would say that one of the important the important question I think right now that we should address is probably how you can manage to get the time and space localization of the protein. So basically how in a cell you can have the right protein at the right time and, and, and doing his right job. And if you talk to biologists they will tell you oh, it's normal you get the, li the ligand there at the right time. But I think it's not, <laughs> it's, not it's a chicken and egg problem. So I think that uh, it might be very, very well possible to, um, uh, um, to, to, to use this in vitro system and in parallel in vivo system to, um, to evaluate what is the relative contribution of biochemistry in one hand, on the other hand, what is the relative contribution of physical parameter like membrane shape, membrane tension, viscosity, and also the role of cell shape and size. So I was turning, telling you this morning, uh, Petra Schwiller trying to, to do this uh, to reconstitute the session machinery. And for that, she has to adjust also the size and the shape of the cavity. So I think it's very, this kind of question is interesting. And on top of that, I think if we can do that, and using both in vivo and in vitro, we can also find out about feedback mechanism. And I'm pretty sure there is also interesting system about that, how the, the shape feedbacks about recruitment of protein and so on. And I think on top of that, if you add uh, a cytoskeleton uh, and, and so on, uh, uh, you, 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 you end up with a very rich, uh, uh, very rich, uh, um, very rich problem. Uh, something also about this problem of uh, time and space is a signaling. And I, I think that signaling of in cell, or at least in, uh, in system biology, is often seen as a sequence, uh, a sequence of reaction. 
And I think the special uh, uh, aspect is also often missing. And I think it will be also interesting using an in vitro system maybe to understand uh, better that, right? Um, yeah, so I think, uh, well, okay. So what I'm trying to do now is uh, trying to uh, use a, a very simple, so, so what I find a kind of simple system to address this, this uh, question, both with in vitro and in vivo, and is to uh, reconstitute this kind of uh, uh, structure you can see here, which is called philopodia, that you can see at the, at the level, uh, at, the, at the edge of cell, which is used by cell for sensing the environment. And as you can see on, on the on left sketch, you can see this is a, a combination of different types of proteins, uh, actin and membrane. And, um, so, and now to understand how this process is basically nucleated, initiated at the membrane level, and how the proteins uh, are sequentially recruited depending on the shape and the feedback between shape and recruitment and so on, and how, how, you, how you can build up this system which is not is complex, but not as complex as a full cell, I think it can give us already some idea about uh, how uh, space and, uh, and, and, uh, and time can just play a role. Okay, so um, this is uh, some clue that I propose to you. Thank you. So let me start by disagreeing with our chairman and agreeing with our chairman. I mean, I agree absolutely with big problems like <clears throat> CO2 and energy and water. But I, on the other hand, think of urban garbage dumps as just ways in which our society is storing valuable rare metals and things mm -hmm. like that for a slightly later time. You can make the same case about nuclear waste disposal dumps. So, you know, one man's trash is another man's livelihood. What's really struck me about today is that if you look at the range of problems that can be mimicked or understood in biology, we've just, just, just barely scratched the surface. We've had a fascinating series of talks, but they've talked about a very small fraction of the things that one could in principle find in, in biological systems. And that's very encouraging because it says that it's all there. But there are two other things that I think are encouraging. One is that if you think about biology, it's intrinsically, in the words of our friends in physics, a low energy phenomenon. And this does not require the Large Hadron Collider or cryoscopic temperatures or anything of that sort, at least with current life as we know it. And what that means is that a lot of the questions, the really most profound questions in this area, can be addressed without complicated stuff. And one of, the, one of the, I think, mandates of this meeting was to think about the question of whether this was an area in which developing world science might have something to contribute. And I would argue that this almost uniquely is an area in which there is the potential for smart people, and you have know, to be smart, clever experimentalists to do something anywhere in the world in competition with what's being done in Europe and the United States. In fact, maybe ahead for the reason that we get all tangled up in expensive instrumentation. But let's just think for a moment about what we haven't talked about that's interesting. One subject is information. The way that information is handled in biology is really, I think, quite different from the way that information is handled in most of our world. We tend to think about information from the point of view of Mr. Shannon. And if you think about Mr. Shannon, um, he came to that by being asked the question of how do you pump bits down an aluminum wire to get the most error-free message transmission. He was working for the telephone system on a very practical problem. So we now have a statistical mechanics of information that actually is perhaps completely inappropriate for biology. And the wonderful, wonderful thing about biology is that it is essentially completely concerned with function. So that if one is looking for new functions and new solutions to new functions, one plausibly looks to biology, and it's hard to find anything that's more permeating in our society than information. So where are we going to get new ideas about information? And I think one way is going to be from biology. And in particular, one area of great interest, which I'll come to in a moment, is the stability of networks. 
So information is one thing. A second is energy, in the words of our chairman. And I remind everyone of something that I think you all know, which is the largest methods, the largest batteries, and the most widespread method of storing energy on the planet is as a concentration <coughs> gradient across a two nanometer thick wall, otherwise known as the cell wall. And these concentration gradients are sodium, potassium, or protons. And that storage is what drives ATP synthesis, which drives the cell. And it's interesting that we all know about it, and after decades of trying, no one can really come up with anything synthetically that even vaguely resembles it. So it's a completely misunderstood process. No, not misunderstood. It's understood in a certain sense, but not in another. But it leads to another very interesting subject, which is large molecular machines. And of course, the molecular machine that converts the sodium potassium gradient into ATP is one of the most amazingly complicated things that you can find, as is the ribosome, as is many other things. How do we think about these machines? I mean, is it all there for a purpose? Or is it just baggage that's hung on from some other part of things? I don't think we have any real notion. Why are these the size and complexity they are, and how do they get together? A fascinating, fascinating, deep, to me, question. Then a question that I ask my students to their vast annoyance, uh, it's one of many things I do to their vast annoyance. Think about two systems that are dissipative and out of equilibrium. One is the cell, which we've been talking about today. The second is a candle flame. And they do the same thing. They both burn a reduced hydrocarbon fuel with oxygen and make CO2 and water. But in the case of a candle flame, basically it makes some light and mostly heat. In the case of a cell, it makes everything we know. How are they different? And one of the ways, of course, in which they're different is that there is a capture and reuse of free energy in a cell, which is unimaginably more complex than there is in a flame. But both of them are complex kinetic networks. And these are enough examples. I could go on at, at some considerable length, but I just want to close with one last thought. And this is, again, both for us and for the rest of the world, in a sense. And that is that one of the questions that one can ask about new areas is, is there something fundamentally new here? And I periodically talk with my friends who are physicists. I have friends who are physicists, and they say, Schrodinger equation, we've got it. The, you know, the pathway from H2, or proton plus an electron, to Beethoven is completely deterministic. We just need to know a few of the details along the way. And this touches on the word emergent, which we brought up somewhere along the way. Because in, in principle, that remark may or may not be, be correct, but in practice, it's certainly not correct. So what is there in biology that we need to think about that's fundamentally new? And I would argue that nowhere in science at this point do we have any idea about how to handle large, dissipative, interlocked networks of anything. And in the sense that the world was revolutionized by quantum mechanics and understanding, at least empirically, how things that were very small are very different than things that are mesoscale. I would argue that the ability to begin to even think about understanding the cell leads us into understanding climate, leads us into understanding megacities. What do you do with 50 million people in one place? What do you do with all of these constructs that have the characteristic that we can admire them from afar, but we actually can't manipulate them very well right now? So I think in looking at the cell, we see something that we don't see with many small systems, which is classical chemistry and physics, but being played out in a new arena, which is one in which there are many parts, dynamic, out of equilibrium, not understood. So I actually think this is a marvelous area, both for the potential for science, for new function, for the solution of problems, and to integrate, in some way, science globally. And I applaud our 
sponsors at the Royal Society who picked this out of what I'm sure was a, a flood of very interesting possible prospects, because I think this was an exceptionally good choice and the first step in a thousand miles. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess uh, there's probably a lot of questions. We haven't got too much time. Um, so I'm, I'm going to forego the pleasure of just kind of c coming back to you on some of the things I thought and, and let the audience really speak because I feel like you, you, you need to have a chance to kind of talk about some of these things that, that uh, our panellists have brought up. Are there, are there questions from the audience that are immediate? There's one over there. I mean, uh, uh, yes, uh, of course, that's the sort of thing I'm thinking of. Um, what, and, and there is work on, on <coughs> self-assembling structures. They're, they're not able to assemble anything terribly complicated or useful from my perspective yet, but, but that's not to, to discount it as, uh, as uh, potentially an important future direction. It's a question there. Um, Marika, this is uh, this is sort of a general question. Um, from the things that have been said today, I was thinking particularly about the cockroach example. Um, cockroaches can uh, feed on sewage, and so they're basically able to recycle sewage into these amazing structures uh, that you um, described earlier, the, the legs with 230 muscles and so on. Is it possible that perhaps one day we might be able to create machines that we find useful um, that can do the same thing, that can consume sewage and cr create them, uh, related to the question that's just come up, um, these amazing structures uh, to, for our use, if you like? Hmm. Well, it's a, it's, I think it's an interesting thought. I mean, of course, we already have sewage treatment plants and we... Um, already have all kinds of work on biological remediation of groundwater pollution and so on. Um, you know, apart, apart from methane or um, maybe the ability to concentrate um, rare metals or something like that, nothing, you know, terribly sophisticated is, is coming out of those processes yet. I don't know, let me, let me hand it over to some of the other panelists and see how they'd like to enlarge on it. I would only point out that we are the product of sewage production. <laughs> and so the part of digestion which really works is what we call sewage. It's the microbiome. So um, there's a lot there that but obviously can be done. You guys all work in this area. I mean, does it not, are you not just in awe of biology's ability to, re, to use all of its stuff again and again and again? I mean, isn't that just inspirational of the most... And, and the fact that we are so far away from that, despite George's comment earlier about these being presents for future generation, I've got, we've left them lots of presents, haven't we? Nuclear reactors that have got nucleotides that are going to last for 100,000 years, yeah. they're going to love that. Um, maybe they will find a good use for it, but haven't we been a bit profligate as a generation, kind of leaving them lots of problems to sort out? I think I have to respond to. I want to um, one thing as you as you brought the point up um, that occurred to me is that whenever I try to think about what we might do at a national level, I get very depressed. And when I think at a local level, I feel much more optimistic. Um, San Francisco has de has declared that it will become a carbon neutral city, and it's pretty close to being there. It's also decided it will be a zero waste stream city. It's not so close to that, but it's it's much closer than it used to be, and. Um, Things like urban mining are, are practiced today, um, and the, the idea of 100% reuse of whatever is on that parcel of land. Um, and I'm just, uh, just making the observation that, that it, it seems that I'm seeing more progress at a local level than I am at, at some larger scale. 
<laughs> Nothing more to add. Okay, there's, a, there's a, another question back there. To say, is it possible that you, you, mo you mentioned the idea of perhaps one day there might be soft robots walking down London streets like starfish but mm. big as trucks? Is it possible that those soft robots might be the very things which we need to clean up our seas one day? Yes, they certainly float. The, you know, the issue with cleaning up <laughs> junk in the sea is a, is, a very, is a very intriguing one. There is one thing to remember about organic matter, and that is it doesn't last for very long. So I, I do think that these gyres in, in the South Pacific are, they're certainly unsightly and they're certainly not a good idea. On the other hand, unlike rare isotopes which are with us for, for several hundred thousand years, they're with us for maybe a hundred years. And so every time you have a, a, you know, a large leak from the seafloor from an undersea oil bed, you probably produce more organic junk. It's, I'm not denigrating the importance of these, but I, I think they're a hundred year problem, not a hundred thousand year problem. There's another question there, yeah. Um, very general question. How should we go about actually developing new science? Should we be driven by motivation or should we be driven by curiosity? So, touching upon the DNA origami, so it was first developed not with any motivation per se, but more out of curiosity. What's the way to go? Good question. It's a, it's Over to a, you three. It's a big question for a long time. Um, I would say that uh, usually it's good to uh, probably to do both. I would, uh, my, my, my impression is there are things you cannot just imagine from the beginning. And so, I mean, you have to, to do science uh, with without a, a very unapplied uh, goal from the beginning, I think uh, you have to continue to do that. But if you have, I mean, we were talking about many problems which have to do with uh, ecology and so on. You have problems so, to solve. So of course you have to uh, use a technology or imagine new technology based on your expertise to, to try to solve the problem. So I think you have to do both at the same time. I mean, there is no good solution for that, I, I think. But uh, a lot of, uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure that they're, they're just uh, doing things by, as you say, curiosity, or at least to for, the, uh, the, for understanding um, problems, is always bringing a new, new, new technology, always. What is, there, is, the right ratio, is, is there the right ratio now? Like, is there too much curiosity and not enough applied, or what would you say? Uh, you You've got a certain amount of money to spend. Yeah, yeah huh? exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think that uh, um, uh, probably by making too much apply from the beginning, uh, you, 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 I mean, you cannot do everything, the money is limited, so of course you somehow cut on the, on the curiosity. So, and if you do only curiosity, also you have some urgent problem to solve. So I think that uh, the balance is, uh, is uh, usually not what politics thinks, but... Uh, I mean, I, personally, I'm always amazed with sort of global warming problem that we're scientists and engineers, we understand the, how big this problem is. We can see it coming. And we're not all downing tools on our curiosity-driven research and just getting on with mm. new... Are we? Why, why aren't we? Surely, I mean, this was a war, right? And it did happen in the war. People just stopped making whatever they were making and they went on to, to do things that were for the war effort. It's not happening with global warming mm. for the science community. Why not? Too much, too much. Uh, Do they not take it seriously enough? I think there is too many, uh, the, there is too, ma too, many, too much uh, financial interest not to take it seriously so far. So it's a very short term view. Which, mm. But uh, it's, uh, I mean, I don't know, a war, a war is immediate. So you see it and you, you die if you don't do anything. So I think that so far in the history, I have the impression that nothing has been done uh, with a long term uh, vision. I mean, it's, uh, and this right. is. Same, same for, for nuclear waste and, and so on. I mean, we know and we still don't do anything. So I think, but it's, I don't know, you can, you can probably react to that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe Denis has some idea about it. But uh, I think that in the history, not much has been done on a very uh, careful plan. And uh, even though if you know catastrophe is coming. Which we do. But you no, know, <laughs> but it's not tomorrow. It's but just maybe after There's an interesting point about this. And the world is not quite as bleak as perhaps one makes it out to be. To me, one of the most 
surprising things that's happened in technology in the last period of time has been the enormously rapid growth of solar silicon, primarily because of the utilization of capital in China. And if you'd asked me 10 years ago if I thought that renewables, renewables would be a big deal, I would have said, sure, but not in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, if you look now, silicon is probably, you know, it's, it's headed toward maybe 15 percent. And with 15 percent from wind, at least in some parts of the world, uh, you're up to 30. That's truly remarkable. The United States is, has peaked in its, its hydrocarbon consumption. That is, we'll go down from here for a variety of reasons. So <clears throat> there's actually been, on global scale things, some pretty remarkable things have happened. But, but, and you say, this is the result of innovation. Yes, maybe. But innovation comes in different forms. There's innovation in science and technology, which is what we tend to think about. There's innovation in process, and then there's information in business models. And most of what's happened with solar, because it's a global problem, has had to have been an innovation in, global mo in, a, a, so in a business model. And it may or may not make sense from the long-term financial perspective, but it, you know, it, it's not completely bleak. We have made progress. And given the fact that I think people have only begun to wake up to this problem in the last 15 years, maybe 20 years, it's not rapid enough, but it's rapid. Are there any final questions? Is there any from our world audience questions? Or are they all? Yeah. In despair, They're suicide. Having a beer. <laughs> uh, there's a question there, yeah. Um, I just wondered if, if the panel could comment on, um, so current technologies, we have quite perfect structures and, and, and systems like silicon-based structures. And nature tends to cope with irregularity, defects, fuzziness. And I think, is that something we need to, to come to terms with? Well, it's an essential part of Darwinianism, right? I mean, you, you have to have replication be error prone. Otherwise, you don't spin off a variety of variants which allow the circumstances to determine which is the fittest. So it, it, you know, we don't know how to use that. Florian's work is uh, an effort to try to harness the power of that. but. We're still, I think, figuring out how to do it. Is there, that's it, I think. Um, I think we've run out of time. Um, thank you very much. It's just, I, I think it's just down to me, really, to say thank you very much again to all our brilliant speakers who've done a fantastic job today. Um, uh, and thank you to the Royal Society for hosting this, and thank you, Dennis, and, and your team. Well, just to round the meeting up on behalf of the organizers, um, first, huge thanks to the staff here at the Royal Society, to Stefan and his team for organizing the first ever meeting of this kind worldwide. So thank you all for the efforts you've put into organizing this. Let's hope it's the beginning of the Royal Society really reaching out in this kind of way to people around the world. The second thing I want to say is that I'm going to go <coughs> briefly back to the reason for this meeting, which is, of course, the first publication of a refereed journal of science in the world 350 years ago. And it was a very interesting submission to the first editor of philosophical transactions. I referred in the morning session to the architect of the bottom-up approach, which was Descartes. In his treatise on the fetus, saying effectively, it's all in the sperm. Notice not the egg, but that was the <laughs> misogyny of that time, of course. He was <laughs> absorbing that from his contemporaries and that you could, as it were, mathematically reconstruct the whole organism from that. His arch rival, the top-down integrationist, was Benedict de Spinoza, who sent a submission to the Royal Society in 1665. And it began, it was a letter to Henry Oldenburg, the first editor, and indeed the first secretary of the Royal Society. And it began, Concipiamus Yam Si Placet. It was all in Latin, of course. 
Imagine, if you will, a little worm inside the blood. This little worm would be able to understand the motions of its surrounding particles and how they develop, but this little worm would not understand how those motions are constrained by the whole. This, of course, is the top-down view, and we need both, of course. Philosophical Transactions never published um, Benedict de Spinoza's letter in his lifetime, but if you look at the cover of the journal which is publishing this sequence and its first issue of Interface Focus, you will find Benedict de Spinoza's Latin letter, which is kept here in the archives, on the first issue of Interface Focus. And so that brings us finally to tell the world that that's where the articles are all going to appear. In fact, they're already online, um, and you'll be able to enjoy the complete set very soon in a published form. So, only remains for me to say, once again, thanks to the stellar group of speakers, to some extraordinary questions from around the world and in the audience here in London, and to the world, to Bangalore, to Sao Paulo, and all the others who've been listening and watching online. Thank you all.